I moved to Washington, D.C. the spring of 2012 because I had a girl who loved me there, and if I didn't, then she wouldn't love me there or anywhere. I uh, took a decent, if reclusive job. I met few people I could speak with in my free time, paced alone, or saw the girl, most often with her company of friends. At one such party, five months in or so, I stood among them, drinking beer, and listened to them talk of resumes and jobs and trips abroad, and watched them preen. A young man who was dressed a little sharper than the rest, his name was Cam, we'd met now thrice, was introducing to the group the acquaintance that he had brought for show and tell. Said Cam, you've read about my friend, you know, in the Times a few weeks back, the coma patient. Uh, <laughs> He said, Cam, you've read about my friend, you know, the coma patient of the Times a few weeks back. The circle oohed. One asked him why he'd come. He said, I got invited there. He left it there, so Cam continued for him, saying, Mike was in the coma for the drugs they gave him to reverse the radiation he took in Japan. A tall man said, wait now, I think I read this story. You're a hero, right? And was there also something about outer space? Mike sighed. A weariness eclipsed his face. To save him, just in time, uh, Another guest arrived flamboyantly, and with the ease of practice, called the room's attention to himself. And in the shift, Mike was forgot. But I was stuck behind a table in a corner and had nowhere else to go. Two other awkward men remained. We three all turned to Mike, expecting him to speak. He didn't right away. I fiddled with my drink. At last, he said, okay, nobody has believed me yet, but if you want, I'll tell you what be uh, befell me as I slept. I said, please do. I lived a life as real as this, he said. I was another man. I was a space marine, a conscript soldier stolen young and forced to act the hegemon's rapacious will. I was a boy the day the soldiers came and burned our crystal cities from the sky. They loosed a plague to sick the countryside, some few to survive some months. They took us as their slaves. They broke our minds to nothing, and they taught us how to hate, to kill, to train our brains and bodies strong, to bare our teeth, and with a savage pride make manifest our will. And for this hegemon, I've taken lives. I've killed with knives. I've melted towns, burned sea beasts in their swarms. In space, I've patched the holes from frozen men come hurtling through our hull. I've seen a thousand warships all arrayed in splendor gleaming. Then in carnage, then in ruin, I've seen seven planets burned to glass. But that life I leave in the past. I love much more the days I spent on green glass pieces beneath the sun to watch the dance of moons above a placid world. I've seen from dust stars birthed and cried. And I love more the way my parents loved me in our crystal city in the clouds. I keep inside the jokes through hardship chaired and all those who have helped me how they could. I keep in memory my children, though I never saw them grown. In memory my loves from first and fumbling to last and sure and even now in sweetness say their names. And I will tell you, though I know you don't believe, that I have seen what humankind will be, and we are great and cruel, but we are small and kind, we're proud, we're gentle, true, and we can hold convictions. We do know what's right, and when we're at our best, we stand for it. We hold it true beyond all pain and doubt, and as a banner past the grave, my girlfriend sidled over to the table's other edge and smiled my way. I smiled back and warmed the way I did when she was close. We listened. Mike spoke on. I lived my final years on planet X, appointed to a garrison in place to keep the people subjugated to the cruel predations of the hegemon. The planet's suns warmed gently, and one, sho one moon shone amethyst. Another sapphire pale, the people seemed a kindred of my own. Their struggles seemed the same I suffered, but still I stood against them in the square that day they pelted us with rotten fruit and mud. I heard the lasers hiss. The crowd began to howl and wail. I smelled the blood. They rose against us stoning soldiers with their kitchen knives. They stabbed and sawed our necks with beams and bricks. They broke our skulls and smeared the streets with gray red pap. We broke and ran. The sky pulsed twanging to the thump of jump jets as our soldiers screamed down from the clouds and with concussion balls and sonics mauled the crowd. I watched. A passing squad collected me. We chased those left still running, stunning them with clubs, our fists, and microwaves. We bagged them. Came the vans to haul the hostages away. A brooding quiet fell. The air hung wet and charged with silent, spiteful energy that jangled potently the city's spine and thrummed the nights with turbulence to be. The governor... A weak-eyed, pig-nosed man declared that in reprisal for the crimes committed by the local populace, nine lawful executions would be held. Convicted prisoners were forced to raise the scaffold. Watches doubled. 
Doors were locked. By night, we soldiers prowled 20 deep to keep the curfew, but we found no fight. The crowd assembled grim and orderly that day and waiting and waited. Dour as the drizzle moaned and shuffled in the wind, the scaffold loomed above them, stark and bare. A barricade enforced by voltage, spikes and conscripts throng stared down the crowd. Atop a tungsten tower with old campaign friends, I scanned the shooters ranged on roof and walls. The governor sat on a balcony among his toadish retinue and guard. He read the sentence as we watched to see that no assassin burned him as he stood. The nine condemned were made to mount the traps. Six men, two women, and a little boy. The hooded man walked down their line and slipped the synth cord round their necks. The young boy cried. I writhed inside, my vision swam and filled, the colors blurred to black and fell away from off their edges, framed in faded gray. I saw the boy I'd once been, long before, and with conviction then I knew the right. I raised my rifle, spotting through the sky. Right now it's mutiny, I said. It's join or die. I pulled the trigger once, then twice. His head exploded into emerald flames, his chest evaporated into reddish flakes. I beamed the balcony with, re uh, with beta rays. The bodyguard remaining formed and fired, my brother's sharing cover blasted back, while snipers on the walls pinned down the guard. Around the, sca around the scaffold, riot frothed and raged. A torrent fell, sharp lightning cracked. The mob in long pent fury finally released like storm tides roaring, cresting, burst and surged to drown the barricades and drown the floundering guards. The square in chaos poiled over. Through the streets we poured together, put the torch the symbols of authority. We took the armory, the palace, victory. Mike spoke the loudest now, and enough had circled round him to cause reluctantly the rest to gather round and with politeness, with disdain or boredom, hear his story told. We cleansed the continents and took the fleets. <clears throat> we took the fleets and cleansed the continent. The planet X convulsed with strain released, and all the scattered cities dotted on its ancient emptiness. Rebellion rose, the planetary despot we deposed. We uh, toppled statues, emptied out the jail, lit fireworks, and marched parading through the streets with dance and drums. United in our common liberty, we met together with the locals and worked out a system under which we'd live in peace and rule by common mandate writ. The populace returned to farm their fields. The spring blew fresh in from the west. They joined in joy and made an art that shone with age-long sorrow overcome. Some soldiers stayed in garrison. I left and wandered with a few companions till we found a first-loped valley claimed by none but flush with birds, a spring, and sulfur streams. The patter of jackrabbits' feet and birdsong sweet would greet my morning. Through my days I'd roam the hills to check my traps and fish. Each night we'd roast our catch on open flame. And as we let the days fall past unmarked, I found in simpleness a longed for rest. Of all my other life, that season in the sun is what I now remember best. My girlfriend edged around the table, came up next to me, and bit my shoulder as she nuzzled close. I kissed her hair and snugged my arm around her waist as Mike spoke on. We knew it wouldn't last, he said. I saw a dust trail rising in the distance from my vantage on the ridge, and by the time I'd reached the stream, their runner had arrived. The mass detectors picked up something large, and spectrometric readings indicate the telltales of the Cromwell Drive. We think that it's the fleet, he said. They're coming back. We hung our heads. I lifted mine to watch a last time the sunset's rays uh, linger on the firs, then turned and tramped away to join those ready to make our stand. That night, the Hegemon's reprisal jumped into the system with a quantum flash that dimmed the stars and moons and sliced the hills into black shadows in a bone-white glare. I stood on station to respond to and repel a landing force and waited, eyes raised up and hoped their fleet would fall in ambush to our fighters hid behind the sapphire moon. The comm box kept its silence. Above, the stars as always shone and gave no sign of the armada falling towards us from beyond the moons. At last it squawked. Engage. The night sky, soundless, ruptured, thin green-blue lines flashed flickering between spheres of amber that a thousand times each blink would blossom into being and collapse. The comm box squealed out static, chopped up whales and truncated transmissions trampling each other. From the turbled voices came repeated, there's too many, there's no way! The comm box squelched out mid-transmission. Night again was still and dark. My hairs all stood. My palms ran sweat. Arose out from the dark, a keening, eerie dirge. 
Some burrowed into bunkers dug beneath the streets, while others swarmed away from town like ants abandoning a, abandoning a flooding hive. I stole a hover scoot and skimmed the road. I ran that machine faster than it had been built to fly, afraid I didn't have the time. Before I reached my hide hole in the hills, with charnel flame, the city burned. Already in the crowd, the smartphones glowed. Side conversations spread. My girlfriend left to pour some wine and in the kitchen stayed to talk to someone else. But Mike spoke on. From orbit, leisurely, with their bombs, their beams, and weapons worse, they erased the cities, slagging temples, towers tall, and all this peaceless industry and arts. Then sutures split across the sky as drop troops falling triggered sonic booms and crashed to land. They formed up and prepared a safe place for their troop ships to arrive. These wallowed ugly down from orbits and converted belching noxious fumes into ground-based facilities from which they launched their raids to find, to capture, and enslave. But though they searched, the woods were vast, and I had long since learned and struggled in a life of war the secret ways to live unseen. I never let them find a track of mine. I found some others, locals and some mutineers, who hid below a long abandoned mine, still in resistance yet, and joined them, though I knew that we were doomed. We formed a wretched, grubby colony, but though our stews lacked meat, we lived in fear and darkness underground, and knew we had no chance to just live normally again with them. My brothers and my sisters down the mine, I found once more a family's love, and more so than the darkness, fear, or pain, that love would tint the color of those days. We raided a supply outpost for food and medicine one day before the dawn and tripped off an alarm. We raised the guards and lost three friends before we got away. We, felt we held a funeral that night once we had shaken chase. One in our family said, we can't go on this way. It's one by one until there won't be any of us left. His words died without answer in the dark. You know, he said, there is another way. They'll take us in. They'll take us back. And is that worse than squatting here and eating rats? Just think, we used to live in comfort and security and we threw it all away. For what? You call this liberty? You really think we're free? And what good even are we doing here? We never had a chance. We never should have tried. Then thousands would have never died. The revolution was a great mistake. He searched our faces. He stopped to search our faces for a code. Nobody in the circle spoke a word. He asked us, do you really think it's worth your lives? We answered, most of us. I do. I pointed to the graves, and they did too. I've been a slave, I said. I'll never live that way again. The circle drew in tight. A few hung back to keep the exits closed. You just don't understand, Deepak. I swear it will be just the way it was before. And if you don't believe me, then you'll see. It's for the best. I'm sorry. It's too late. A scarlet ray blast from the entrance to the grotto, blinding, flashed and slashed a man in half. We scattered for the tunnels out, the traitor fled. I yelled out, it's a raid! They spilled in shooting, gouging channels in the walls with beams and lights, and shredding men and women as they ran with steel flechettes. The cavern's roof collapsed. I lost my hand. I dug through rubble till I smelled fresh air and found an open channel leading up. I tore my shirt to tie a bandage from my mangled arm, then crept into the woods. I slipped into the nights, and keeping head, I staggered towards the safe spot we had set as rendezvous. Three times I heard the whine of skimmers seeking, but they passed me by. The crowd had gathered round again to, see, to hear what seemed to be the story's end, and listened, faces slack and bored, for Mike to stop so they could have the room's attention back. He said, I stumbled, blind, delusional, afraid of unheard voices, half insane from pain and loss, until I found our safe hide, and as dawn's light grayed the wood, I collapsed. Without a drink of water, in a daze that redly pulsed inside my skull each time a breeze would graze my ragged stump, I lay against some rocks and dreamed of loves long lost. I slept all day on, undisturbed. If others had survived the cave's collapse, then they would come. At sunset, I heard furtive steps. A shadow fell. I saw the traitor's face. I lay there hating, helpless, as he said, Good God, your arm's a mess. You look half dead. He forced me to take his water, eat his drink, then check my bandage, blanched, and said gangrene. He sat. They said it wouldn't be this way. They offered amnesty. They promised food. They bagged me at the raid. That's when I talked. I waited after. No one else has left. I spat at him. The effort made me moan. I'm sorry, said the traitor. Then he forced me to take drink. But still I know that I was right. The revolution had no chance. It, it was romantic, but it doomed our race. We just need to survive. Then if it takes a hundred generations, we'll be free. 
I passed into oblivion. At first the traitor seemed nearby me still, but as I faded gently into blankness, he receded until only calm remained. Or so he claimed, said Cam, but all we know is that our main man Mike here just woke up and started talking about space, he laughed. Ah, oh, it must have been a crazy dream. All laughed. The tall man said, but really though, you don't believe you actually have lived another life. Mike said, I, it doesn't matter much, I guess, and you don't have to. Maybe it was real, I said. Why not? Why not believe there's something more than what we know already? Across the group, a sallow girl spoke up. I had a dream like that the other night, she said. Well, <laughs> not exactly. Not in space. And everybody listened in relief. I left the conversation, drank a beer, and stood next to my girlfriend for a while as she talked to some somebody she knew from work about some other work friend they both knew. I left that conversation too and stole outside to see if I could bum a smoke in secret, even though I knew I'd have to brush my teeth. Outside was only Mike. He offered me a spirit and we smoked. I didn't ask about his other life. I felt like we were waiting for a bus, but for the moment, that was fine with me. The night died down. The party goers, loud and happy, only slightly drunk, said their goodbyes and tapping on their phones, they called their hired rides. I drank until I slept. I paced those tidy streets for slow months more. I drifted from my girlfriend, then we split. Before a year, I left. But of that time, all that I want in memory is love. I'll leave you all with one last quick quip, if you'll take some advice from these lips. Although men may swear, they never dare. They don't plan to wet just the tip. Thanks, guys. <laughs>